So, good morning. Today, I wanted to finish up talking about flocculation, um, do kind of a, a simple example to be a little bit familiar with what kind of problems we might, might look at there. We'll solve more problems um, and look at more kind of the practical side of sedimentation um, in a couple lectures, but before we get to there, I wanted to go a little deeper into uh, surface chemistry of particles and surface and surfaces in general as one component of particle um, st stability destabilization. Um, so today we're going to talk about surface chemistry. Next time we'll talk about um, particle size distributions, how we how we look at that. Probably mention that today as well. Um, before coming back to strategies to destabilize particles, because we, we did the, the quick overview of all that um, just as background to, to dig into this, um, but then we can look at precipitation reactions and kind of put, put it all together and look at how realistic some sedimentation um, applications might be, um, things like that. So that's the plan. Um, do have my audio working this time, so you should be able to hear this when we, if you ever go back to the recording. Okay, so we, we left off last time talking about formation of flocks in a flocculation chamber, and essentially we're reducing n over time, and we want to increase particle size by decreasing the number, letting particles stick to each other. And I just realized this one's okay. So with that, we we said that we need to understand something about the mixing conditions, which will give us um, give us information about the the likelihood that particles will collide and have an opportunity to stick together. And so as we as we looked for a way to model the overall rate at which particles are going to stick together, you know, the, a dn dt is going to be some function of k and n, right? A negative, it's going to be negative kn in the general sense, um, but then what goes into k is really the question here. Can we determine that without, um, without having to make the observations of just checking every time to see how, how well it's um, performing. So that brought us to mixing conditions. That's where I was discussing um, this mixing intensity term, that concept of a, a, an object moving through liquid or liquid moving past an object, and the velocity gradient of water as it uh, gets slower, next, closer and closer to the surface. And that's um, we can understand the mixing intensity that way, and it's the square root of the power added divided by the viscosity times the volume um, of the system. Okay, so from there, what we want to do is um, first talk about the, the concept here again. So if we have a certain number of particles in a volume of water, so We'll say the seven particles there, and we perform the process, and all seven particles stick together. With some assumptions, we could say we could know that volume of the new particle. Um, again, that's an assumption that we we might question at some point, but we can we can imagine. Um, Essentially, what's happening here, if we compare in the volume, we have this initial concentration equals 7 per volume, and then the final amount here is 1 per volume, one, var one particle per amount of volume we have. And so maybe, you know, in one liter, we, we might have, you know, dirty water, it might be like, uh, one times ten to the seventh particles in the liter. Um, so that it 
realistically, that would be a pretty small volume here to just have seven or just have one. Um, but you know, it's it's relevant. It's relative to each other when we ultimately will we can solve our equations in some form of n over n naught or maybe what we're what we started with compared to what we were left with. Um, so n naught over n. You know, we, we can solve mass balances in either either form and then make use of that information. And essentially, we can describe how many particles are in the new particle with that relationship. Okay, so d setting it up this way lets us describe um, how many um, original particles per aggregate. So when we go from n naught of seven in a liter to n naught or to n of one per liter, that's n that means n naught over n equals seven. Okay? So that's a, a very simple and convenient tool that we can use kind of on the at the big picture to say you know, um, to, that gives us direct information about how many particles are there in the system um, and how many of them uh, became, you know, were put into each aggregate. So you can imagine if this is maybe like a one microliter volume here. In one liter, this would be just happening at scale and you would have your, your number would shrink by a factor of seven. Um, You'd have lots more particles, but this is essentially the process, and you'd have have this happen. You'd have multiple composite particles when you started with more there. Okay. So, about that rate constant. Um, again, this is coming from a the simpler book. Our our book has um, has the same type of stuff, and we can. We could look over that, but I wanted to give, again, that kind of a simple case to know where we're heading with this, something that we can um, use without too much trouble. And at, at, at the core, the same processes, the same concepts are involved. It's just a matter of what other assumptions do we want to account for. So here, we're going to describe the rate constant K for this you know, dn dt reaction. The K, we're going to say, <coughs> is equal to a collision efficiency times 4 times the ter a term called the flock volume right, times the mixing intensity, all that divided by pi. Okay, so we're going to break down these, these different components. And what you'll see, you know, for example, this collision efficiency, we could very easily assume that this depends on um, some aspect of the particles if they're not all uniform. So the assumption that all particles are uniform um, would really impact um, the math here. So we're, we're just taking this simple term, and those of you who have um, taken my undergraduate class or, or a similar class probably have seen this before. So. Um, review in some sense here. So this collision efficiency is basically that fraction of particles that form the new combined particle. Um, the fraction of collisions that, that do that. Uh, so when two particles collide and meet, they're not always going to stick together. Um, so maybe you have particles collide 100 times and only 70 of those collisions form a new particle this is what's capturing it, that collision efficiency. So it's a, a fractional number. It's going to be between 0 and 1. And um, you know, if 70% of the collisions work, that's 0.7. Uh, so it's 0.7 of the total collisions are working. So So if we have 
one this guy forming two particles that's a successful collision or we might have two particles they collide but then they split back apart and that would be the unsuccessful collision so you know you could think of it as if you had um, maybe a, a bunch of velcro balls that all have some of the, the sticky side and some of the catchy side uh, and they're just mixing them around how many of them stick and cling together and you know in some cases maybe all of them do in some other cases maybe there's just not enough of the, the right kind of sticky side stuff okay so then one, what we can say is that the extremes here if this um, if this term collision efficiency is one that means we are completely destabilized um, so that means every time that a particle interacts with another particle gets close enough they'll stick together whenever they meet um, whereas if it, the collision efficiency is zero then we have exactly no aggregation so complete stable completely stable particles so technically this can be zero as well um, you know I, I guess you could say okay it's never going to be zero if we have destabilized particles to any extent but um, so the the case where no flocculation is going to happen is the when that equals zero okay so that's that's um, part of the term here we already talked about G the mixing intensity so aside from that the only thing left here is this omega term and this omega is flock volume and this is a unitless term because it's actually volume per volume it's kind of like the volume concentration like a in a liter of water how much of that volume is occupied by particles okay so this is always going to be less than one because we're looking at the volume of something within this volume so we we know that this is going to be less than one and it's going to be a lot less than one unless we're dealing with a, a really thick slurry which we're probably not going to be dealing with so um, so by a lot and it's also going to be greater than zero Omega's, we'll just say that. Okay, so in some sense, it's you could sort of relate it to the collision efficiency, but that's going to be like 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. But this is going to be, you know, five times ten to the minus fifth or something. So uh, the way it works here, we have um, the equation is essentially the volume volume of a particle um, times the number concentration of particles. So the number of particles divided by um, the volume that we're using. And one thing to note here is we're typically going to be working with particles in terms of X number of, you know, X number of micrometers or something. So what will probably be most convenient is to convert everything to meters. And then you're looking at in one cubic meter of water, how many particles do we have and how much volume is that occupying? So what we I mean, you can convert it how you like, so long as your units of volume end up matching, because the volume of the particles you're likely going to calculate in meters or some form there. So you need to either convert that to liters if the particles concentration are you're calculating is in liters, or vice versa. Okay, so essentially this uh, pi times diameter cubed divided by six, that's the volume of a sphere. So here's another case where our assumption of a spherical, par spherical particle is coming into play. Um, certainly that's not always going to be true. So it, again, another place where we could add more complexity to our computations if, uh, if necessary. So then what we have here is, you know, the the volume of a particle, and let's just say we're doing it in, cubi in uh, yeah, cubic meters, if that's 0. 0.000005 meters cubed, it's a very small number. 
right? So, and then we end up with a very large number of particles in every cubic meter. So it, it'll turn out so those will, you know, balance each other a bit, and you'll end up with some very small fraction of your your liter or your cubic meter is um, is going to be your your flocked volume. But in essence, you know, meters, cubic meters per cubic meter is the, the units. So that cancels, but you could look at it as cubic meters of particles per cubic meters of water. Okay, if you wanted to be really explicit about those units there. Okay, so with that we have a a rudimentary way to calculate um, everything here, and this is just rewriting it, um, having all the terms up here for you. <clears throat> so let's take a quick look at a problem. Um, so this is, again, not, not from our book, but a simple problem from another one. So to improve settling, there's these 0 0.01 millimeter silt particles from a previous example. They're completely destabilized by adding alum, and it is, they're passed, this water is passed through one of two side-by-side well-mixed flocculation chambers. Chambers are cubic, each with dimensions being 3.5 meters. Uh, they're mixed with paddle mixers that input two and a half kilowatts power um, in each chamber. Water entering the flocculation chamber contains 10 to the fifth particles per milliliter. What is the average diameter of the aggregates leaving the chambers? Okay, so we're given some information. I've provided some information that they, they left out from the previous um, example problem here. And so I'm going to take a couple minutes to solve this. I'll let you go ahead and start working on it. I think we've got more space here. So all the information's here. So I recommend drawing the system as a first step, documenting all the, the pieces of information that you need as a, a second step here. <coughs> 
Okay, so here's a few, few things I've written up already. Hopefully you got this far drawing this. The system here, it's, it says that the uh, water is flowing essentially into two side-by-side -side chambers um, that are identical. So we're splitting the flow evenly then is kind of the assumption. And it's um, we're given the total flow is 3 MGD. So it's 1.5 MGD per reactor here. And then we can calculate the... Um, Volume is three three point five cubed um, cubic meters, and then so we can get our uh, tau, and we can you know, just put up the equations again for you here. So hopefully you got that far and are working on the mass balance to then um, work towards finding that average diameter. What we need to do to get there is to compare how many particles do we have of the initial particles in the final particles, and then do some geometry to, to relate that. So keep working on it, and I'm, I'm going to fin finish filling out this kind of baseline stuff here. Power in watts, yeah. 
couple more terms here before we even solve a mass balance. You can solve for G and the flock volume. So G is about 225 per second, and the flock volume is 5.24 times 10 to the minus fifth. So a couple things here to note what you have to do for the flock volume. This 0 0.01 millimeters, that's, you know, divide that by a thousand to get how many meters. So that's like 10 to the minus fifth meters. Um, the N, or the N naught rather, it here is given as 10 to the fifth particles per milliliter. So you have to multiply that by a million to get two particles per cubic meter. Because it's 1,000 milliliters in one liter and 1,000, oops, 1,000, um, 1,000 um, liters in one cubic meter. So when you put all this together, then you can, then your equation should turn out to be 5.24 times 10 to the minus fifth. Technically, you could change it to liters and then change the uh, volume of um, the uh, 
uh, volume that you're looking at into liters as well. Sorry. The volume here, but we already have that in meters, so that's kind of the easier way. Did somebody solve for k yet? Because I, I forgot that the other component we need now that we have the uh, omega and g. Anyone have that? And here we're going to read from the um, the problem that the the collision efficiency is perfect, right? Because it says they're completely destabilized. Yeah. So it's, it's point, point zero one plus one rounding to the fourth place. Okay, and we're dealing with seconds here, right? Okay. So then with that, we now have some way of finding that relationship between our initial particles and our final particles. So per each final particle, you know, this n naught over n is essentially saying we have this number of initial particles per each final particle, right? So that tells us that if we just take one plus our tau k, that's going to give us our um, the, the number of initial particles in every aggregate. So that's going to be quite useful. So we'll say this is going to equal um, that 653 times 0 0.0151 plus 1. So I'll do that on Excel real quick. Actually, we can just do that here. So 652. And so this will turn out to be what I just did on the calculator is the tau k. We'll add 1, so it's 10.86. Yeah? Uh, for your flow, shouldn't it be um, 0 0.0438 times 0 0.5, not 1.5? Because that flow is splitting through those two different frames, right? Um, well, we have 3 MGD total. Right, so 3 MGD, and I think what you, what you um, maybe missed here is the one, I did the conversion here for 1 MGD, I, I provided that, so we have to multiply the, yeah, yeah, so that, that's all that happened right there, I took, that's why I took the one and a half times that, because I split the three into the two ways. Yeah, so then we have this uh, the term here where we have almost 11 of the initial particles in every each one of the aggregates. And then we can do a little bit of uh, math here to say, okay, the average diameter of the aggregates leaving this chamber, we have to relate that to the volume. And we have some information about the volume because on a volume basis, we didn't change anything. Right? And this again is a, an assumption that we often make, and it's fairly reasonable. When we have these particles that stick together, they're not doing anything but sticking together, so they're not really changing shape or size in that assumption, right? So we can make that assumption, you know, in reality, maybe they're doing more than just simply sticking together. Maybe they are bonding and um, compressing, things like that. So there, there's room again for a faulty assumption here or a more complex assumption but when we are making the spherical assumption and discrete particle assumption we can say the volume of the aggregate is going to equal 10.86 times the volume of the initial particle right so that's just because we've added 10.86 per of these per aggregate on average. So we can relate that and say with that same um, equation here we can just say put it in terms of the diameter of the aggregate and say diameter of the aggregate cubed times pi over 6 is going to be equal to 10.86 times exactly the same thing but 
our initial particle times pi divided by six. Okay, so then we can we can essentially get rid of the uh, pi over six on both sides, and then solve the diameter of the aggregate. And I've got that written down. And if you want to convert that back into millimeters, actually we can use millimeters in both cases over here and then just leave it there. Um, so before I even finish writing my answer, I should expect that this is larger than, um, well, I guess we didn't solve the volume of an individual normal particle, so that doesn't make too much sense, but should be, you know, not too far from the diameter, right? So it's um, 0 0.0 to, my cursor will come back. 0 0.0221 to millimeters. At the end of the day. So if we wanted to be um, take this a step further, we could then look at okay in a, in some sedimentation basin. In fact, the previous example. Uh, in this book where this is coming from, looked at the silt particles and whether or not a clarifier could remove them, and it turns out it couldn't quite remove these ones. So then we do the coagulation flocculation, and then we can calculate again with this new diameter for the new particles and check it there. So that's kind of the connection here between, uh, between these different components. Okay, we will come back... Um, to the application side of sedimentation, um, as I mentioned, but I want to dig deeper now into surface charge. So the the first question I'm going to answer with you is why do particles have some charge? Because we're looking at you know the particle stability. Why do some particles um, stick together? You know what makes them stable versus destabilized and the surface charge was one of the most important components right that's the longer range of the forces in our force balance um, so charged surfaces um, often come from some aspect of surface chemistry now we could look at um, a few different things and we're going to start with clay minerals this also applies to other types of um, solids, especially with a crystal structure. Um, and then we're going to take a look at organic matter and wh what can happen if you have a surface that's got organic molecules present. So this would be a kind of the, on the inorganic side, clay minerals, um, as in our example right just here before, like silt particles are usually some sort of clay. Um, clays and silts are um, in some way synonymous. So why are these particles stable and not colliding? Well, they have some charge. How why do they have the charge? A lot of times it's because something called isomorphic substitutions occur. So a clay mineral, maybe, maybe it has some crystal structure or component that contains Al2O3. This isomorphic, isomorphic substitution is essentially substituting one of these three plus aluminums for an Fe two plus. So then we have three plus, we have two times three plus, and now we have three plus um, and a, a two plus if this is Fe in ferrous form, right? So then our net charge, now we have the negative. Okay, so that's one way. And then I just grabbed a couple of pic pictures from, uh, from the web here. So in this case, we have oxygen, uh, basically silicate, right? Si with four oxygens, Si is in four plus um, oxidation state. And so if we substitute the silica with a magnesium, that's two plus, that's gonna change and, and create a minus two difference here. And then if you repeat this over a larger pattern, you know, you have some perhaps more complicated crystal structure or um, clay mineral structure, 
um, repeating, and you substitute every now and then, you're going to have a significant comp uh, portion that is um, charged at the surface. So this happens um, with a pretty significant frequency and uh, explains why a lot of inorganic surfaces have some surface charge. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, kind of the first component. Another, another thing that can happen is we can have uh, chemical bonds at a surface. And so here I'm writing the surface as this S with the three bars here. That's it, some sort of surface site. Um, and again, with the clay minerals, and the, in this case, the surface could be some the surface of a particle, or it could be the surface of your reactor wall. It could be any surface, OK? Um, any, any solid surface. So we might have these hydroxyl groups on the edge of some molecule or, on, or maybe bound to um, the surface of some a bead or something. You can actually purchase amine coated beads and different uh, silica beads or polystyrene beads that have functionality on the surface for different uh, scientific experiments. So if we have this hydroxyl group here. Um, essentially what, what can happen is if we change the pH, it'll pull that off and at certain pHs you'll have a negative charge. Uh, so low, uh, high pH, so very basic, will tend to pull that hydrogen away to, to satisfy um, or to have it somewhere else and you'll have that negative charge. If you have lots of protons in solution, um, you can add a proton there, and then you have a positive charge. Okay, so this um, this change, the change in charge with pH, um, we we often describe this occurrence with um, pKa, or you could also just look at it just Ka, but pKa is essentially the um, the equilibrium constant for this type of reaction, where A is this particular bond. And so if you take your pH up above the, this pKa for this, um, or maybe the reaction between this SOH, because this is going to be in equilibrium with S and O minus plus H plus. Um, so releasing releasing that hydrogen or putting it back on, that's an equilibrium reaction that's going to be occurring. And you can shift um, the balance here. Is it going to be more of one versus more of the other by shifting the pH? So the, the net charge on a surface or perhaps on a complicated organic molecule, um, in, so this is you know, just a search for natural organic compounds, natural organic matter. Um, we find all sorts of different complex materials, humic acids, tannic acids, different things um, you might find in nature or in, a, let's say, a wastewater treatment plant. And if we want to know how those are interacting with each other, maybe as a small colloidal particles, or even in the case of maybe you're wanting to understand how your membrane is fouling, um, this type of chemistry is going to be occurring, and it's going to be occurring all across several different types of bonds. Um, we could have carboxyl groups, amine groups, um, lots of other groups as well. We'll undergo this type of chemistry, and so you can have some charging based on uh, simply the organic chemistry here. And each type of bond is going to have a, a different pKa. It's also going to be related to what else it's next to. Um, so depending on electron withdrawing, different dynamics like that becomes quite a complicated system if you're wanting to completely map and predict the, the whole thing, right? If, it, if you just wanted to know um, one portion of a molecule, maybe that's simple enough that you could figure out what exactly is happening there. But in bulk across lots of different types of molecules, it becomes a, a pretty complex scenario. And then um, we can't use direct, just simply direct chemistry to do it. So instead, one thing we would do is, um, if we're considering these macromolecules or colloidal organics, we would 
do observations changing the pH and see, hey, okay, what has happened here? What's the, um, what's the charge now? And you know, one thing we can find is something called the isoelectric point. And similarly, it's kind of synonymously, the point of zero charge. So if you get into working with some sort of a particle physics or uh, colloidal chemistry, these terms will be quite useful because when you, when you get a particle or one of these large macromolecules, and you get the pH to the right spot, the net charge can be zero uh, in some cases. And that point of zero charge is going to be very interesting and very important because um, even if you don't add a bunch of ionic strength or whatever, you can potentially destabilize the particles simply by getting them at that point of zero charge where they're, they're not, um, not effectively uh, extending that electrical field out into the solution. So these are, you know, um, essentially at what pH. So the point on the pH scale that this happens. There's probably other ways you can manipulate um, this even at a constant pH. Maybe you can change the temperature and that affects the pKa's a little bit. Um, so there might be some other ways you can achieve or manipulate the system, but pH is essentially the one that almost always controls charge effects um, in this regard. The previous um, topic, the isomorphic substitution in inorganic stuff, um, perhaps you can, you can uh, tweak that with the way you're manufacturing your particles, right? So maybe if you wanted particles with a certain charge, you could cause you know, maybe with temperature or different um, doping of stuff. Maybe you could create a, a particular particle you wanted, but the pH won't really affect the isomorphic because that's a chemical difference within the structure of the, the system there. Now, it's possible that you could have both of these happening simultaneously. Maybe you have a, some sort of a inorganic surface that then you've attached some maybe C a carboxyl group or something, you've found a way to attach it um, effectively, and then you can have that pH effect happening on top of the charge that's already there. So that's certainly something that uh, can be done. Okay, so that's, that's a bit more on the, the charging, why particles have charging. I um, wanted to go a little deeper on the, that opposing force, the van der Waals. So if we do find that point of zero charge or we decrease the electrical double layer for a charged particle, the van der Waals forces can take over. And really these are essentially what we call non-chemical bonding. Um, so bonding of some sort or attraction of some sort that's not chemical in nature. So it's not an ionic bond. Um, it's not covalent bond. It's stuff like hydrogen bonding. Um, it's the interaction between electrical dipoles. So water, for example, I'll talk a lot about that in a case example here in a minute as well. Essentially water, if we look at it, let's just draw simply. Um, we have an oxygen and two hydrogens, and the oxygen is relatively electronegative, right? So it's drawing electrons to it. The oxygen itself wants more negative charge and then the the um, hydrogens end up with more of a positive charge these are partial charges these are these are not you know as a molecule water does not have a an h plus an h plus and an o2 minus but because it's kind of in their nature to end up that way it, that's more of their natural state we we actually often show this as like the partial charge um, something like that. So essentially what's happening is oxygen is withdrawing electrons and so the if you look at the location on average of the electrons 
they're centered a little more towards the oxygen than the hydrogens. They're traveling around, they're doing all that, but the electron uh, cloud is going to be a little more centered around it. So the fact that um, O is electron withdrawing That means we have a dipole here where we have a negative pole and a positive pole and another positive pole. So that's what we mean when we're talking about dipoles is some distribution of the charge and these dipoles allow for interactions that are um, not very strong, but they're, they're present. Okay, so when wa two water molecules are next to each other, they're gonna want to arrange themselves accordingly. And this, this has an impact when you freeze. It's lots of different uh, um, crystal structures of frozen water, um, in part because the, this arrangement, you can maybe tweak it a little bit if you add some salt, if you add, if you do change the, um, maybe the temperature gradient or something, you can freeze faster or slower. There's different aspects and this, the hydrogen bonding that's going to happen between one molecule and the next, you know, how they arrange themselves to have some favorable interaction here. And, you know, in a system of water, these interactions, even though they're weak, they're going to be what's providing water with surface tension, um, for example. So there's, there's a, something we call hydrogen bonding. Um, there's this dipole interaction. Um, both of those are at play within water, and you know I don't I don't actually know which one's more dominant, but um, hydrogens can tend to stick to each other a little bit. Um, hydrogen bonding, I think, is what explains a lot of um, solid materials that have a low melting temperature, like uh, butter. If you if you think of heating up butter just a little bit or even leaving it out on a warm day, it starts to get much more softer. It's because we're dealing with bonds that are not actually chemical bonds. They're these loose um, van der Waals bonding, keeping the molecules in a, kind of a together fashion. Um, some other things that can occur is one molecule can affect the charge and the, the distribution of electrons in a neighboring molecule. So there's an interaction there that can essentially create a dipole in a neighboring molecule. Um, so it's uh, some interactions there um, with the, this London dispersion. Those two concepts, I think, are about approximately the same or uh, directly related. Um, so if you ever see um, the effects of surface tension on water or some insect using that, um, or geckos climbing on a glass, you know, clean glass surface. Those are examples of these van der Waals forces at work. Um, that the, the reason water has some tendency to stick together and resist some, some force entering it, that's just simply because the water molecules are favorably interacting with each other. Okay, so that kind of brings up another um, topic here about hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity. Uh, so to you know, either water phobic or water loving, right? So it's um, phobic meaning resists water and philic meaning it kind of wants water or has a favorable interaction. <clears throat> and so here we see this droplet of water on this some fabric and one thing you might notice immediately is it it looks like it's not interacting very favorably with the fabric which is kind of counterintuitive with what you might think of if i were to take a drop of my water here and put it on my my shirt it's going to quickly go from a droplet to spreading out into the fibers and through the fibers um, and be absorbed so then what what it makes me think here is this is coated or in some way a hydrophobic surface where the water um, would rather be 
uh, not interacting with it. And so there's a, a similar concept. You may have heard octanol water partitioning. Um, it's a way to understand, given some chemical, how much of that chemical partitions into water versus octanol. Uh, you can use it with other chemicals too, but if we have some molecule and several molecules go into the octanol, but most stay in the, the water, it tends to be more hydrophilic case, um, whatever this stuff is. Um, you may be able to do this with particles as well, although usually this is a, a chemical thing. Um, so with the, this droplet, we can actually use that droplet effect to learn about the, the surface characteristics. So beyond just, um, just the charge, I wanted to introduce this because this also gives us some information about whether or not particles are going to stick together. Would they rather be touching water or would they rather be touching each other? And that's, um, that's a sort of a slightly bigger picture. It's like a net effect that all these other features are describing. So if we have two particles and they both really like to interact with water, that means they've got all the water molecules hanging around them in kind of a happy little salvation shell where, you know, whether it's the, the, um, the ionic uh, effects here or whatever, is in a sense protective. And this is, you know, if you were to put these two into oil and they want to be interacting with something that's charged, not something that's completely uncharged, like the oil, then they'll probably stick together. So there's, there's an effect here that, depending on how, how much the, the particle likes the, the solvent, it's going to then stick to something that's um, the favorable interaction. Okay, so we can use the um, contact angle between a droplet of a fluid and some surface to tell us about how favorable that interaction is. So we, we see here um, a droplet with an angle that is uh, kind of sharp here, 75 degree angle um, when drawn, I guess, towards the particle. Um, that, that's low surface energy, meaning it's not a very energetic interaction. It's not a very favorable, favorable interaction. And in fact, and it, what it looks like on this particle, you could draw one where you had a surface and a, par a droplet that really doesn't want to touch it, and it looks something like that, and then your angle is going to be from here to here, and it's going to be above 90 degrees. That's certainly possible. Um, in fact, there's some cases you might, you might notice if you're watching droplets um, roll around on something, in certain cases that can happen. Uh, in some cases, you can actually make water do it on, on top of other water. Uh, it's kind of cool looking when that happens. But the, um, so a high surface area would be, you know, a fabric or something that it's, it's spreading out on. So now you're gonna, next time you're just having lunch and sitting around, just take droplets of water and put it on different, different things and, and watch what happens, right? So depending on the surface, you know, it, maybe your, your phone case, your, you know, your touch pad is probably fairly hydrophobic, so that it's probably gonna have a pretty good contact angle there, um, as opposed to maybe this, this board here. It seems like there's some texture, it seems like there's space for it um, to, to go out. And, you know, like you'd kind of expect this fabric for it to be able to spread out on easier. Um, okay, so those are, those are just, that's just a little bit about kind of that hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. Um, you can manipulate these by manipulating some of the things we've already talked about, right? The, whether it's the van der Waals forces between water and the, the surface, or perhaps the, um, you know, some other aspects. So I want to kind of go through a quick case study. This is stuff that, from my research as a graduate student um, some years back, where we were looking at 
a very hydrophobic molecule, so C60 or a Buckminster fullerene. And one of the things about hydrophobic, hydrophilic, is you can often describe the, the charge polarity. Um, so a molecule that has some dipole, right? Water has a bit of a dipole with the, the positive and then, excuse me, the negative and the positive. Um, so water is going to want to interact with something that also has some polarization. So you might see the, the words apolar or polar when you're talking about solvents or uh, materials. So fullerenes don't interact very well with water because they're very apolar. It's a bunch of essentially benzene and pentene rings, um, no hydrogens, just all carbon. It's pure carbon and lots of double bonds. So the the electrical structure, it's like the electrons are just um, resonating throughout this whole thing and it's pretty much equally distributed through the whole cage. And so there's like very, very apolar. Okay, so when we put them in water or we force them to be in water, they're going to aggregate pretty strongly. Um, what we end up finding is that fullerenes by themselves, you can actually cause them to form these colloidal aggregates. And here we've got um, electron micrograph here, and we have these pretty much nano-sized particles, around 100, 100 or so nanometers in diameter. So the, one of the questions I was looking at is, okay, well, what happens if you functionalize it with up to three groups that either has this, this uh, amine group or this quaternized amine group, so it has a positive charge here, or just some other factor that, you know, this is kind of almost oily-like in nature here, this, this addition. It was commonly used for some other applications, so it's just kind of a reference material. Um, but if we look at what happens with a charge versus no charge, but just adding a few of these pieces, we had some way of looking, hey, we're going to add this charge to the system. How's that going to affect the chemistry and ultimately what we were specifically interested in was the photochemistry because these are photoactive and can be used for disinfection. Um, when you put them in water and they stick together in these clumps, they kind of lost that property. And so we were ultimately trying to overcome that and understand the system. So um, essentially what we found is by, by putting them through sonication, which is a, a pretty harsh um, blasting them with ultrasonic waves, you end up creating cavitations, which there's very high energy, often cause radicals to form. Essentially what we were doing is allowing some of these fullerenes to become functionalized with OH or similar. And so at the end of the day, these particles over here, they all had a bit of a negative charge and they were comprised of lots of these fullerenes and some of those had a negative charge and so the net negative here, um, I guess it's probably more typically O minus on the, the edges or similar. And um, part, of, part of the study we did see that there was some oxidation of the surface. When we looked at the size distributions, we're gonna talk about this more next time in terms of the sizes. Um, the fullerenes with nothing were these solid lines um, that's just repeated. And we're, what we're looking at here is the number of particles at a given size. So the, the further right you go on any, any of these graphs, those are larger particles. Some of them are maybe 200 nanometers, but most of the particles are 100 or less um, in this, this case with the no charge. Something interesting happened when we added the, the positive charge here. And this, this is going to tie into a lot of what we've already talked about. So that adding one positive charge to this fullerene ended up destabilizing it because one positive charge in the system where they were gaining some negative charge led to a particle that was not very stable. Um, and it wouldn't, we could visibly watch it when we were trying to take these measurements. It kept aggregating. And in fact, the, so that's this red one really kind of had that issue for both of these, but the, the B2 or B1 here was 
less reliable, less stable. We just couldn't work with it very long, then it would just settle out of the solution. It would just stick together and settle out. So we really ended up not able to use it if we just added one positive charge there. So that was, that was quite interesting and a, a good example of um, most of what we've talked about today. Um, whereas if we got B3, so three positive charges, um, though they were aggregating a little differently, um, it turns out they became photoactive with these charges. Um, so we did overcome that with that positive charge that has something to do with the way water is interacting with the surface is what we think. Um, but it, it stabilized it enough and we were able to observe positive surface charge um, along with this. Because the, the other thing that I didn't tell you is we were also able to measure the surface charge uh, using zeta potential measurements and the one charge here was pretty close to zero. Um, it would fluctuate. Some measurements were still negative for it. Um, sometimes it would be slightly positive and with two charges, two of these functional groups added, it was in the positive range but not by much and then with three we were definitely positive. Um, so it was really interesting that the whatever phenomena was causing the negative, the net negative charge on these particles really was having such, a, such an impact that it was about one charge per, per, molecule, per C60 molecule. So it, that, was, that was quite interesting and quite impressive. So the theory, and this was backed up with some computational simulations, um, it was a collaboration uh, that we were involved with, is essentially that water surrounds these fullerenes. And you know, we talked about water being um, not wanting to interact with the fullerene, right? Well, that because of the apolar nature. It turns out that that's not quite true. And in fact, what happens is water wants to interact with its neighboring water, doesn't really love the, the surface of the fullerene much in terms of the polar dynamics, but what they end up doing is water with its hydrogens will end up forming a very strong um, chain of interactions with each other. And this, this bond here is a, not really a bond, this is just kind of a sketch. Come on. Sorry. I need to remember to swing by the lab in a minute to have a reminder. <laughs> okay. So essentially what happens is these um, the water molecules form such a tight arrangement that they stick together and lay f flat, not like they, they are um, instead of pointing the oxygen or the hydrogen towards the fullerene, they sort of lay flat and link to each other and that pulls them into a tight cage around the fullerene. So this, their interaction with the fullerene is actually stronger than if it was polar. So this, this effect essentially caused a tight cage of water around the fullerenes, you know, in a kind of counterintuitive manner and that essentially, we think, was restricting the ability for the photocatalytic thing to happen where oxygen comes to the surface. After you know, we hit this at light, it gets all excited, and then we end up with an excited state of single oxygen coming off. That's, that's the photochemical thing that we were interested in. Well, it turns out that process, oxygen needs to be able to rotate in, in that complex when it touches the fullerene, it has to be able to rotate in order for this charge transfer thing to happen. And it was so such a tight cage in the case of the plain fullerenes that we think that's the reason they couldn't perform this action very well. Um, and so in a weird way that's you know counterintuitive to most of what I taught you today, it turns out that that water to fullerene interaction was actually very strong. and very important in that case. And so we, uh, we were looking at it in this kind of computational simulation with one fullerene thing with a, a thousand water molecules and um, the people who did this ran this simulation calculating all the forces acting on each 
atom within each molecule here. So it's like, and then you run it for some amount of time, given the known diffusion constants, things like that. And it's like one nanoseconds, you know, maybe a day's worth of calculations. Um, but it's pretty, quite incredible, quite interesting. But we were, we were able to see that um, for these different fullerenes and see how strongly the two fullerenes would interact in water. Um, and so we see the ones that were interacting less strong um, with each other, uh, we can kind of see that that's, um, we can see what we would, we would predict, right? This one, the two with the positive charges, that was this one and uh, this one here. So they were less frequently tightly stuck together in the system. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, to bring that up because it was interesting and, and relevant here. So next time we'll talk more about um, particle size distributions um, and maybe answer any questions you guys have so far. And then uh, after that, I think we'll go to precipitation. I need to update the syllabus because I've been modifying the trajectory here a little bit. but So we'll do that. I'll try to get a homework posted for you all before too long. And then we'll start thinking about what, what kind of problems are we actually interested in solving for kind of exams and stuff. All right, so that's it for today.